Okay, so uh, welcome uh, to uh, this podcast. And today uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the fraud risks from a generative AI. Uh, but also uh, we're going to be looking at the opportunities for fraud prevention uh, and detection and investigation using the same kind of software. And today I'm really happy to be joined by uh, Michael Owen, who's our intelligence uh, researcher here at SIFAS. And uh, Michael is responsible for research, collation, and evaluation of intelligence to support the development of fraud prevention strategies, and also to deliver current relevant intelligence uh, alert to the fraud prevention community, as well as being the author of the recent SciFast intelligence report, uh, The Rise of Deep Fake Technology. And also uh, with me today, which we're very proud to have, Mark Johnson. Mark Johnson uh, is a long-standing um, specialist, expert, trainer, with lots of experience uh, with AI tools and systems, currently doing some research with uh, the Home Office, and is also uh, also our specialist cyber trainer here at SciFast on the hugely popular three-day Skills for Justice course, uh, Digital Fraud Practitioner. So we're really, really pleased to have both uh, Mark and Michael here today with us talking about uh, some of the issues connected to AI. So. Let's, without further ado, so Mark, I can come to you first. Now, we've all heard about AI. AI has been in the, the media a lot. And you know, it can be quite mysterious and even frightening, I dare say, to, to many people. So can you give us a, a kind of a, a simple overview? What is it in reality? Uh, uh, thanks very much, Ian, for that question. Um, I think part of the mystery derives from the the description of the word intelligence and uh, a lot of the systems that we refer to as AI are in fact not intelligent at all and that's important to understand that. Um, getting to grips with it really really involves us first of all understanding how it works inside the box and very simply um, the generative AI systems that we're talking about today are essentially just systems that have been trained on lots and lots of data so everything written, every image posted, um, everything spoken on the internet, for example. And then they've used mathematics to analyze that data. And they're basically spell checkers on steroids. So they're able to, in response to a question or a prompt, um, come up with a string of words that will make sense to people because they've learned how those words are used by looking at billions of different examples online very large computers, lots of time taken to train them, lots of feedback from human trainers over a number of years. And so they're coming up with responses that seem intelligent to us, but which in fact are just based in statistics. And that's really the key point. Once you get your head around that fact, you can think in different ways about the AI. But if, if you think that it's an intelligent being inside a box, then you're going to be going down the wrong track. And, and go on, sorry, Mark. No, I'm just saying it's a tool. And uh, John, I really like the, the term that you use there, the spell check on steroids, because that is a really, really simplistic analogy where a lot of people can kind of sort of relate to and, uh, and understand exactly what it is in a nutshell. So uh, really, really good explanation there. Thanks, Mark. And uh, Mike, if I, if I turn to you, I mean, in your report, you mentioned, you know, how the use of AI is, is growing and it, it's on the rise. So. Uh, what are the different types of sort of deep fakes that, that you've seen that, that's contained within this report as well? Um, yeah, so from the report, um, like you mentioned, we found that um, in last year, our members uh, recorded an 84% increase in the use of false identities and identity fraud, which essentially is kind of where deep fakes are sort of mainly being used. Um, but like you say, yeah, there are quite a few out there. Um, we sort of categorise them into, sort of, uh, into a few. So you've got uh, your videos, uh, you've got photos, uh, it can be used in audio, um, textual, and then also in sort of real time, which and live deep fakes, they kind of combine the video and um, audio together. Um, but we noticed from um, research that, that I did, um, and even other countries out there, they've noticed there's been a 900% um, annual increase, increase just in the use of deep fake videos themselves. So um, it is an ever growing um, concern and it is on the rise. Um, but then we conducted a recent poll with our members um, for the report, and 79% of those who responded were concerned about deepfakes um, and the threat they pose. 
So, I mean, that's an interesting uh, statistic you, you raise there, uh, Michael, 84%. But surely if you're, you're talking about 84% increase, then this is uh, detected use of AI. Is that fair to say? Uh, this was on the false identities and identity fraud side. So, essentially, yes, yeah, it's yeah, it's on the increase. It's that those are ones have been detected because they would have been filed through our database. Yeah, no, that's great. Lovely. Thanks so much, Michael. And uh, uh, Mark, I can come back to you on that. And so, um, you know, what, what are the key points that, you know, we really need to understand about how sort of AI tools, I mean, we hear a lot about chat, GPT, BARD or MidJourney, etc. What, what are the functions? I wonder if you could, could uh, enlighten us on that. Well, yeah, so as Michael, as Michael pointed out, there, there are different varieties. So you've got text, audio, video, and um, Im still images, of course. And now, more recently, hybrid. So the new um, Google Gemini tool that's been touted heavily through some marketing videos is, is a very interesting development because it's pulling those things together and giving you a mix of outputs, which I think is where the future lies for these tools. And don't get me wrong, although you know, I describe them as as spell checkers on steroids, they are on steroids and they're very, very powerful. And um, in, in the right hands or the wrong hands, they have huge potential for good and for bad. Um, but I think, so one thing we're seeing, in addition to the deep fake trend, which, was, which was, has been very, very significant, uh, we're seeing the, the rise of purely synthetic personas as well. Um, and I'm not sure if Michael includes that under the heading deep fake. For me, there's deep fake, which is attempting to pretend to be someone real, uh, someone else who's real, and then there's the purely synthetic persona where that person doesn't exist at all. Now, in the, in the last year, when we were looking at this, sites like this person does not exist, very popular, but you could, you could see that these were fake images. You could see problems in the image, reflections, earrings missing from one side, nothing the other. Sites like Mid Journey today are producing what appears to be almost completely authentic looking images. And it's important to note there are two ways to, to get these images. If you just go into a site and you prompt it to give you an image, it will give you this sort of perfect Hollywood, you know, smiling at the camera image, which a lot of people feel is a little bit spooky. They pick it up as AI. If on the other hand, you upload a photograph of somebody to the site, not attempting to create a deep fake, but just using that as a, as a, as a prompt, it will give you a much more authentic looking image of somebody else who looks much more human than the traditional AI images. So we're, what we're seeing in, in a nutshell is this evolution and it's becoming more and more realistic as time passes. And so people need to understand the potential the uses of the tool in order, in order to pick up the examples online when they're doing investigations. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark. And uh, Michael, is that sort of uh, you know, that resonate in your report there, particularly that, that Mark was saying, do you sort of add sort of synthetic personas to uh, deep fakes as well? What sort of examples uh, are you seeing? Um, yeah, so our members have mentioned before about seeing synthetic identities being used. Um, a lot of them are obviously, um, they kind of get trumped with some of the members' defences and they realise that there's no kind of credit history check with them, um, or something that yeah, gets flagged up. Uh, but no, we have seen um, synthetic identities being reported by our members. Uh, they tend, we did, we did look at them in a previous report we looked at when we did look at identity fraud, which I think did a uh, part of last year, um, which is where this deep fake report um, kind of stemmed from, following off the back of that. Um, but in terms of you know, examples, you know, yeah, um, some of our members have seen um, synthetic faces, for example, being used to bypass the biometric checks. Um, but then obviously our members have got things in place to pick these up, um, which is how they spotted it. Um, but yeah, we've seen examples in romance scams being used. Um, so that was where Mark mentioned where they bring them together. Um, so someone could be on their live video call um, and be talking to, or appear to be talking to someone completely different to who they think they can be. Uh, but romance scams can bring you know, all of them into, into tech, um, all together. So your messages, videos, and videos can be, um, someone can be sort of being deep faked um, there. Um, seen it on WhatsApp scams. So quite a popular one, it's the, the high mum WhatsApp scam that's going about. Um, that's, if people don't know, that's where um, a parent gets a message from a child or loved one saying something's happened, their phone's broken, um, and they need some help, um, usually um, in the sense of providing money. Um, but we can see that essentially transform into using the audio voice notes. Um, so 
parent would be getting a voice note to say supposedly from their child um, requesting help, um, which is kind of a scary thought there because there was um, there is research out there um, that does suggest um, that sort of parents when they were the research conducted with the parents and some of them weren't able to tell the difference between a deep faked voice note of their child and a real one. Um, so it is out there. We have seen our members have seen um, examples of these coming through. Some really interesting points here, uh, Michael. So I'd like to ask sort of um, both of you really. Um, the first point that, that was kind of raised there is the legacy. How do uh, forces sort of get behind the legacy uh, side of things? Yeah, so to anyone actually, to, to, to both of you, um, you know, if, if you're going to have this, this sort of synthetic uh, image, etc., how, how do the, uh, the forces get around the legacy of that, like you mentioned about the credit checks? Um, yeah, um, I think they will build, like you said, I build up a synthetic identity. Um, the first, they might target a particular organisation who's got slightly lower um, defences in place. Um, but if we just to build that sort of background up, um, it'll take time. But yeah, essentially they'll just find a route that can essentially get them a, through the credit check, a bit of a history to this persona uh, that they can then use sort of maybe later down the line or even once they get what they're after, can essentially almost disappear. And There's also potential if you have, if you're a fraudster and you have older false personas um, that haven't you know, benefited from AI technology, uh, of course, to update those if they're still active um, and to, to start to make them more convincing than they were previously. A lot of people, um, a lot of organizations will have a library, a uh, stable, if you will, of false personas to tell you know, 10, 20, 30, 100 that they use sequentially. So they can always go back and, and the ones that haven't been active yet uh, update those. Particularly true with uh, foreign intelligence operations as well, because this is quite a, a, a big. Um, facet of the, the the intelligence and counterintelligence field, as well as as well as the fraud field. Oh, so yeah, um, and when you're talking about the the high mum uh, scams, and you talk about sort of the the voice impersonation, how how did the fraudsters get hold of that sort of clip of that audio? Um, so yes, yeah, so a lot of that would essentially come from social media. Um, I mean, social media is we're aware is a it's a big database of actually of people's photos, videos, and people. Yeah, people like to share their lives out there. Um, a research noticed that seventy-five percent of adults do share their kids on social media, and eight out of ten adults have followers who they've never met. Um, so you don't know who these people are, who are who you're approving to allow you, or if you're on a, a public profile um, to the uh, to sort of follow you there. Um, but if you are sharing your so, for example, yeah, your kids are playing or their voice on there, then yeah, it's a free database that you from views, which is one error they can go down. That's a really important, important point Michael makes there as well. Um, well, because in addition to that, well, let me start again. That's a really important point Michael makes there, uh, because you've got two dimensions there. You've got the, the issue of our online behavior and the extent to which that exposes us to attacks like this. Um, and then you've got the issue of um, awareness uh, when looking at content and appreciating how that content could have been faked by, by uh, because of other people's behavior. It doesn't have to be your own behavior. So, so I might be behaving naively, or I might be very, very aware um, of what my behavior should be like, but I'm not aware of how other people's behavior could lead to me being targeted very, very in a very, very sophisticated way. So there's, there are two dimensions to the awareness challenge there. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And, and I dare say lots of people wouldn't necessarily think about where the weaknesses are coming outside of their their, their own control. And um, I know, Mark, that you, you've conducted a, a wealth of research on, on this as well and how criminals would use AI tools. Uh, so can you, can you kind of summarise your, your main findings on that research? Yeah, so we're seeing um, a splendid approach emerging. So if you think about um, a fraud or social engineering attack, there's, there's, there are stages in the attack that now involve traditional and AI technologies. 
So you might start with a traditional open source investigation, a hostile open source investigation to find targets. You may start with just an email address or maybe an email address and password that you found online. But then you can use the AI tools to, for example, extract a list of contact names from a LinkedIn profile. So if I'm looking at someone's LinkedIn profile and they haven't locked it down and they've got lots of people following them, I can simply copy paste that list into an AI tool, ChatGPT, and that will build a numbered list for me of all the names mentioned in that, in, in, in that contact um, page. Um, that gives me some additional targeting I can, can carry out. And then I can use AI to write a fake profile, to generate the necessary images, to create deep fake video, to create some audio, create a fake podcast, to even write blogs and, and posts, and to write the phishing emails. So AI features in, in all those stages. And I think as the, as the AI systems evolve, we're going to start to see further automation of that process where you know, the attacker in, say, two years from now will simply click a button, and the OSINT search will be AI generated, the results will come back, and the lists will be formed, and the AI will produce you know, a proposed list of 100 emails to 100 people based on their online profiles. So, so that's where I think we're heading uh, based on where we are today as compared to where we were, say, two years ago. It's really interesting there, Mark. And when we talked about uh, early on um, about how frightening some people might uh, see this uh, with this technology, and, and you mentioned there what can be achieved in the future with just a click of a button. And, um, you know, to, to me, that, that does seem kind of concern. So, um, Michael, with, with your report, I mean, how much of a concern did your report, report raise? And how easy is this technology to uh, get hold of? Um, yeah, you know, I think Mark's right. You know, it's yeah, um, that resonates with the conclusion that the report um, came out with that this technology is essentially improving at a rapid rate. Um, it has obviously taken off, um, you know, thanks to sort of Chat GPT, which it just yeah, when that sort of thing does get released, um, it does help speed up technology. But that is unfortunately the world that we do live in. Um, so I mean, our members are always aware of this threat. Um, they are aware of it and they are sort of implementing things to you know, defend against it. Um, as you mentioned earlier, yes, they have seen examples of it, but that's because they are stopping it from um, being successful and getting through. Um, but how easy is it? Uh, yeah, like Mark says, it's almost incredibly easy out there. You know, the technology exists. It's now out there for the world to use. Um, there are websites, for example, that will um, list um, the programs if you want for sort of face swapping and videos for if you want to free if it's free, if you want, to, if it's paid, a subscription, um, which I think is um, one of the scary things is that yeah, it's out there, but it's been out there for years in the likes of social media with the face swapping, for example. Um, while that is technically a early stage rudimentary version of it, it is still you can still consider it down as the deep fake technology. Um, and um, you mentioned there about uh, the implementation of controls, um, which is a really good thing. So, uh, Mark, I'm, I'm going to turn to, to you then with your research. Surely then we talk about it being frightening, but it's not all doom and gloom, I'm sure. So um, I'd like to ask you, um, what kind of security and fraud control opportunities are there? Well, it's a great question. Um, and I, the first thing to bear in mind, because as I say, people, people tend to get very scared. We were very scared when the internet was launched. I remember I was in the fraud control team at Cable Wireless, and they said, we're going to go public internet everywhere all around the world. This was the late 80s, early 90s. And we were in panic mode. This is, it's, going to, it's the end of the world, okay? Um, look at all the insecurities we're aware of in here in the network. Um, and it was the same thing, I'm sure, when, when the postal service was introduced, and you didn't have to social engineer people down the pub. You could send them... You know, a cleverly written letter. Um, so, so this is all part of the same process of clever fraudsters employing whatever technology is available today to try to trick people. And people are susceptible to being tricked, but they're also susceptible to being made aware. And, and that's really the key, that we make our staff and colleagues aware, and we also make our customers and the wider public aware of how the technology works and what it's capable of, so that they treat everything with a reasonable level of suspicion. And at the end of the day, you know, if you haven't got a face-to-face -face relationship with someone, if you don't know this person from Adam or Eve, uh, you really shouldn't be buying into this amazing op opportunity they're presenting you with online. Okay, that, that, that's the bottom line. 
Um, and I think, I think you know, for me, that's the key control. Once, once we have the awareness, many of the controls that we already have in place, many of the, the red flagging um, activities that we already have in place are going to apply to the same extent that they do today. Technolo using technology to actually detect images or to detect text, very challenging. The, 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 the evidence shows that it's not particularly effective and the AI keeps moving forward so fast that it's going to keep be beating that technology. It's, it's mostly about the human firewall. Some uh, really good tips there, there Mark, and, and you know the key point there about that sort of raising awareness and also keeping up to date. And you know that's a great opportunity that the 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 online courses, the webinars that we're going to be running with your good self, sort of February onwards. You know, I, I urge people to have a look on the website and, and tap into that because those courses will provide that up to date knowledge uh, and create that sort of heightened uh, awareness. Um, what about uh, Mike, Michael, your, your report then? What is your concluding um, summary on your report then? Does that align? It does, yeah. You know, as Mark alluded to there, you know, it's evolving at a rapid rate. You know, the tech side of things is almost going to be um, impossible to detect. Um, but like I say the best defense is you know, the human firewall. You know, if you're, for example, interviewing someone for a new position, um, like everyone's you know, hybrid or almost remote now, um, if you haven't met this new um, starter in, in person, how can you be sure that they're the real person just from uh, the video chat? Um, so, yeah, the conclusion from the report is, yeah, it's similar to what Mark said, yeah. Um, it is expanding, technology is going, but while the technology is helping those people do deep fakes, it's also helping our members and organisations um, defend against these deep fakes and AI technology being used. Um, but, yeah, the, as Mark said, you know, the best defence is the human firewall. Great, thanks, thanks, Michael. And um, Mark, you mentioned uh, that when the internet came about, you know, there was a lot of concern that this was the end of the world as as, as we know it. So, if we kind of swing that back to uh, AI, um, a lot of people are having a, a very similar feeling about this is the end of our jobs, uh, and that's probably a, a concern for uh, a lot of people. So, can you dispel any myths or uh, on that? Uh, many things have been the end of our jobs. I guess. It's I'm going to repeat myself, industrial revolution, end, end of you know, many jobs. Um, people find new jobs. And around every new technology, there's a, there's a wealth of opportunities to work with the technology. Okay? So we're going to need people who understand how to implement and use AI. We're going to need people who can re-engineer business processes to take advantage of AI. We're going to need people who know how to, to write prompts. Prompt engineering is, is, a, is a new profession. And... Uh, most people don't take the time to learn how to do that properly, so they don't get the benefit from the tools. So these are these are skills, you know. And here we are talking about how to deal with AI risks, you know. And um, at some point in the future, I may get paid for that. So, so, <laughs> so, so there are lots of opportunities to work within this space. Um, we just have to get rid of our fear, you know. I, I was I've always been afraid of technology. I find it very challenging, but you have to make that effort, learn learn how it works, and then you can see where the opportunities are. And I, I don't think this will be any different, to be honest. I, I, I can't see people saying, you know, I'm going to just talk to an AI doctor, an AI lawyer, an AI accountant. You know, it, it, that trust isn't going to be there. And um, the more we work with it, the more we'll understand how it can get things wrong. And we'll want that human interface. We'll want that expert knowledge behind it. Um, we're not just going to trust the computer. Yeah, some very wise words there. Um, so we talked about the threats, the opportunities, and also the risks. So, um, Mark, I just I just wonder then, sort of lastly, if 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 you could kind of, if you were going to pick, if you were going to pick one AI risk and sort of one opportunity, then uh, what would it be? Okay, so in terms of, I've got. Can I give you two? So, yep, you, yep. Okay. You. So in terms, because for me, there's deep fake, and then there are other AI applications which are just as important and significant. Um, so on the deep fake front, it really is that hybrid approach, that, that pulling together of the text, in video, audio, and still images um, into one, because that's going to give you a much richer you know, sort of set of false personas, fake synthetic personas online. So that's, that's the big risk there. Um, the opportunity, of course, is to, in terms of deep, not deep fake, but in terms of generative AI, is to use generative AI for fraud investigations, for other forms of investigation, 
We sometimes have to maintain online personas that are not our own. Um, and so we will have much more convincing personas too. So, so that's a bit of a cold war sort of scenario there with the, the generative AI. Um, but the other forms of AI that we need to not forget about are the decision making tools. So there's lots of AI for fraud detection, there's lots of AI being used for, for financial decisions, medical applications, all sorts of activities, robotics, of course, and, and, so, and so on. These are targets. So in the same way that databases have been targets for, for decades, these AI systems that make decisions in sensitive areas are now targets for hackers, cyber criminals, and fraudsters. They have more data. Uh, and of course, if you can influence those decisions in various ways or deny service, then you can cause havoc. So I think we need to not take our eye off that ball um, because it's not just about generative AI, it's all these implementations of AI. It could be as simple as a smart home or as sophisticated as a nuclear plant, but there, there are going to be lots of attacks on those AI platforms. Really interesting there. And again, we are talking about not taking our eye off the ball. It, it is all about that sort of keeping up to date, and that keeping up to date does provide for that sort of constant uh, awareness and being being vigilant to threats out there. Uh, but also the opportunities that can arise through AI in fraud prevention, detection, and investigation. And um, I think that's um, you know for, for me, and I hope for the people watching the the podcast, this has been sort of really uh, informative and, and insightful. And um, I look forward to picking up those discussions in the webinars and the online training that we're going to run, uh, Mark, uh, with yourself and also tapping into your report there, Michael, to make sure it's uh, intelligence led too. Uh, so I do um, urge people to look at the website and to look out for those uh, online training sessions because they really will be worthwhile. Um, so is there anything else that you think before you go that you, know, that you, you want to mention? Just to engage with AI. Um, you're not going to understand the risks if you don't, and it's fun to use. I use it a lot as a fantastic set of tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think I, yeah, it's right. That. I think embrace it. Yeah, it's new technology, and um, yeah, don't be scared of it. And um, it's yeah, unfortunately it's here to stay. <laughs> <laughs> it's here to stay. <laughs> Well, that's unfortunate, unfortunate. Yeah. Um, Mark uh, and uh, Michael, thank you so much for your time. It, it's really been enjoyable listening to your, your expertise and, and knowledge around this subject. So thank you very much. You're thank welcome. You.